the introduction of Arabic numerals to European society utterly revolutionized the economic system. This is Dr. Dorsey Armstrong. She's a professor of English and medieval literature at Purdue University. You might have seen her in videos like this. And today we're discussing how Arabic numerals transformed the history of finance. You see, these 10 digits make up the very foundation of the modern world. These simple numbers enable us in finance, in tech, science, medicine, and so much more. So how did we function before these 10 simple digits became mainstream? So prior to the early 13th century in Europe, we're still using Roman numerals. And that's a really complicated way of figuring out what a number is. The transformation from these complex Roman numerals to simple digits was because of the influence of the Islamic world. And the adoption of the Arabic numerals was why the West was able to undergo a financial revolution. Look, medieval Europe inherited a lot from Rome, including religion, laws, architecture, and most importantly, numbers. And from that, the religion, laws, and architecture are still quite visible in today's society, but Roman numerals are noticeably absent. And that's because of one simple reason. It was extremely difficult to use. It was unnecessarily complicated and cumbersome. So prior to the early 13th century in Europe, we're still using Roman numerals. And that's a really complicated way of figuring out what a number is. To make matters worse, Roman numerals didn't have a concept of zero. And also, Roman numerals don't really have a concept of zero that you can note down when you're doing calculations. So the Roman system had survived in the West after the fall of Rome. And for many centuries, there was little need to contemplate a change. The feudal economy was basic enough that you could just do fine with simple arithmetic, with addition and subtraction. But all that began to change in the 13th century. You see, the economy became more complex as trade intensified. Up until the early 13th century, especially in Italy, because the Italian city-states are the great traders and merchants of the medieval world, and they are moving goods and people and wealth and money, not only into the European continent, but they're also across the Mediterranean, into North Africa, into the Middle East. And of course, they've got to make calculations. And they tried different methods to keep track of the numbers, but most of those methods were not reliable. If you're just doing simple arithmetic and subtraction, you can do that in your head. And there were lots of ways to sort of keep track of a computation. Finger counting, many people were taught a particular kind of finger counting where you'd hold this finger and this finger as you were doing a calculation to sort of keep your place as you were calculating it. Tally sticks were another way to keep track of calculations. And then something called a table abacus which was a board that looked kind of like a checkerboard. It had seven rows, it had different colors counters on it. Now one has to understand that the medieval abacus being referred to here is called a counting board. It's quite different from the abacus that we popularly imagine today. You've got this very complicated looking board with different colored counters. And as the calculations are happening, an assistant has to move a certain colored counter to a certain spot to indicate it's how much, this much, take away this much, and people would go to school for years to learn how to do this. That's right. One of the biggest drawbacks of the Roman numeral system was that equations could not be independently verified by just looking at them. A person had to redo the entire equation to check if the original calculation had been correct. As you can see, at a time when trade and movement of goods was increasing in frequency and volume, this kind of slow calculation was a significant hindrance. Errors could easily go unnoticed, leading to costly mistakes and disputes. A reliance on manual recalculation made it difficult to maintain accuracy and trust in financial dealings. Ultimately, all of this stifled growth and trade in many ways. And then we have the world of usury or interest. It's a mystery how you calculate interest or do complicated computations with Roman numerals. And you had to rely on the brains of your counter, of your person who's moving the counters around the table abacus, who is doing finger counting or using a tally stick and then telling you what the final sum is. The only way to check this work would be to have someone else run the entire calculation all over again. That's the only way to confirm because you're relying on an individual to get the counters in the right place, to then do the mental calculations, to mark it on the tally stick and then tell you. So you have to trust that person. But with Arabic numerals, it was much easier for multiple people to look 
at a calculation and check it much more quickly rather than getting your guy to run the computations while the person you're trading with, they have their guy run the computations and see if they agree. That was really the only way to do it if you're talking about complex transactions. The old system just could not keep up with the increasingly complex demands of an emerging capitalist economy. Fortunately, just across the Mediterranean, another civilization had long adopted a system that could easily meet the needs of large-scale commerce. You see, the Arabic world had inherited the numbering system from its contact with India. As European merchants began to increase trading with their Arabic counterparts, they began to notice and became fascinated by the much more advanced numeric system that they were using. And one of the most important figures in our story today is this Italian mathematician by the name of Leonardo di Pisano. Today, of course, he's known as Fibonacci. In 1202, Leonardo di Pisano, who had lived with his father as a trader and a merchant in North Africa, so he'd been exposed to Arabic numerals, he recognizes, hey, there's a much easier way to do this. And so he writes a tract called the Liber Abaki, uh, which explains how Arabic numerals work, explains the concept of zero. Uh, he's perhaps best known as the father of what's known as the Fibonacci sequence. Now, I'm sure you've heard about the Fibonacci sequence, but here's a quick refresher. The Fibonacci sequence is sort of a math problem where if you have a pair of rabbits and they reproduce and then those rabbits reproduce every generation, how many rabbits do you have? And in simple terms, a Fibonacci sequence is one plus one is two. And then you take that two and the number that came before it in the sequence. So one plus two is three. And then you take the three and the two and then that's five. So Fibonacci sequence is a progression of numbers in which they're always the sum of the last two numbers. Anyway, De Pisano was well acquainted with the Islamic world. He himself had been taught mathematics by an Arab master. He may have been one of the most important authoritative experts in Arab society at the time. He traveled to places like Egypt, Syria, Greece, and Sicily. But really, he introduced this tract which explained Arabic numerals, also gave us the very earliest form of algebra introduced to the European world. And it's fair to say that although he is the one who introduced it with this tract that he wrote in 1202 and then he revised it and recirculated it in 1228, even if he had not done that, Arabic numerals would have made their way into Western Europe, absolutely for sure. because. It's a much easier way to do these calculations, but he's the first to do it. Now, as expected, there was pushback against De Pisano and others who sought to introduce an arguably superior system. I mean, for one, the Christian world was still in conflict with the Islamic world. Many were reluctant to adopt Muslim system. To make matters worse, compared to the more literate Islamic states, Europe at the time was relatively culturally backwards compared with the Arabic civilization. And then there was also this worry that the system would put many people out of employment. As you might imagine with any new technology, there's pushback, especially from the guild of the counters, the guys who use the table abacus, because they're out of a job all of a sudden. And so you have a lot of pushback, but pretty quickly it becomes clear that this is going to make keeping track of our ledgers and our business accounts so much easier. But forward-looking thinkers like De Pisano worked hard to ensure that its adoption became widespread. As a gifted mathematician, he saw the great potential that this system could bring. At least amongst the merchants, the bankers, and many scholars, there were no objections to its adoption. And one of the biggest advantages that the Arabic system boasted was the concept of zero. You see, Roman numerals didn't really have a concept of zero. I mean, they always referred to the concept of zero, but they never actually talked about it. This absence made calculations cumbersome and limited the system's ability to represent either large or fractional values. The way I would explain it would be that zero helps you identify the difference between 1, 10, and 100. And that's sort of the simplest way to think of it. There's a ones place, a tens place, a hundreds place, things that we learn in elementary school. And with Roman numerals, uh, it's really hard to indicate that, but zero makes it possible to differentiate between those and to differentiate between them really easily. But that is essentially the key. It's a placeholder because prior to this, if you have a one and you don't know, is it in the ones place? Is it in the tens place? Is it in the hundreds place? And you don't even have those concepts of a ones place, a tens place, a hundreds place. But the zero helps you indicate that. That innovation, which happened 
so much earlier in places like India and the Middle East, you know, centuries before they were using zero, made keeping track of numbers much easier and simpler and more efficient. However, it wasn't just complex calculations that were made much easier. Adopting the system also made it easier for European traders to communicate and conduct business with people in the Islamic world and with India. Merchants, especially those who were engaged in trade outside of Europe and say with North Africa or the Middle East, they were now sort of speaking the same language as the people with whom they were trading. And so it was just much simpler. It was sort of a one to one transaction. And the numbers don't have to be translated in the same way that a conversation would about a, a complex computation. So it made life much easier for them once they understood how to use this method of computation. Now, of course, at the time, the West was re-emerging from its so-called Dark Ages. Now, the term Dark Ages is a bit of a misnomer. It's better to highlight it as a period of low economic activity rather than some significant decline in innovation. But now that it had once again began to flourish, it was hungry for knowledge and eager to absorb anything that other cultures had to offer. The Western European medieval world owes a whole lot of its learning in a variety of disciplines from mathematics to medicine, uh, especially to science, to the Muslim world. And in fact, they were able to sort of distinguish, okay, we're gonna go conquer the Holy Land for Christendom and we wanna take it away from Muslim controlled factions. At the same time that they recognized that knowledge and learning from the Muslim world was far superior to their own. So, for example, the first medical schools in medieval Europe are established in either Italy or Spain, and they are based on their, their program of learning important medical treatises that come out of the Muslim world. In the Muslim world, they were far advanced in terms of doing sort of anatomy work. Their innovations in terms of physics and astronomy were far, far beyond what the Western Christian world knew at the time. And they came into the Western Christian world primarily through Italy and through Spain. And there was quite clearly an understanding that this knowledge is useful and superior. Now, it might be surprising to learn that the relationships between the Christian West and the Islamic Near East were not as hostile as they would later become by the turn of the 14th century. Many people from both sides traveled freely between the two great civilizations. In general, there was a degree of tolerance that was exercised when dealing with the supposed heathens at the time. In fact, some of the great philosophers in the Western Christian world um, found the Islamic philosophers and writers to be very influential. So it is not this black and white Christians versus Muslims thing that we sometimes you know get as, as a picture of medieval society there was in many instances a great reverence and respect for the knowledge that was coming into the medieval european world now at the same time i will say that as we get further into the 13th and 14th centuries and we have this rise of a persecuting society there would be a negative reaction to people practicing different faiths different belief systems but prior to this, before there's the land crunch, before there is um, a decline in the amount of resources that are available to go around, especially in very cosmopolitan places like Italy or Sicily, Jews, Muslims, Christians pretty much live side by side. I mean, there's a little bit of prejudice, but it's a much more egalitarian and less persecutorial society than it is just two centuries later. As you can see, the road to adopting the Arabic numeral system in Europe was far from straightforward. However, it ultimately transformed not just commerce, but the course of the entire continent's history. What began as a pragmatic solution for merchants grew into a mathematical framework that underpinned the Renaissance. It was more than just a change in how people counted. It was a leap towards the modern age and a transformation of financial practices. Now, if you've made it so far into the video, write out 011235 in the comments, just to give a nod to our friend Fibonacci who helped transform the financial world. I'm also very grateful to Dr. Armstrong's time on this interview. She's written a lot of amazing books and has an impressive body of work to share, so check out some of her work in the description of this video. 
Also, subscribe to the channel if you haven't already and make sure to check out this other interview that I did with Dr. Armstrong about how the Knights Templar actually created the first ATM system. It's a fascinating story, so make sure to check it out. Thanks so much for watching and I'll see you next time.